We started looking at Elijah first by considering the times that Elijah lived in. Elijah was a prophet in the northern portion of Israel, the divided kingdom. And he'll be a prophet during the reign of a king by the name of Ahab, who's married to a queen by the name of Jezebel. Jezebel, of course, brought a negative influence on the kingdom. She was an outsider. She was brought in from one of their enemies, one of their neighboring enemies. And she would have a strong part in not only directing the people, but also her household into the worship of Baal. We uh, set the tone there for the days that Elijah was in. Seemingly, Elijah prayed that God would show himself strong from the book of James that references that, and that God would withhold rain. And God honored that prayer, and uh, God gave Elijah the job of going and telling the wicked king Ahab that God was not going to send rain. We noticed in the scripture that God had given promise to Israel that they would receive rain, and it would come at his blessing in the proper time so that their crops would grow and to develop. And so for three plus years, they went without dew and without rain. During that time, Elijah went down to a brook where he was cared for by a raven. And then from there, he was moved on to live at the house of a widow in a neighboring country. And God provided not only for Elijah, but for that woman as well until the time appointed where Elijah was told to go and present himself to Ahab. We read of his encounter with Obadiah, another man who had been faithful to the cause of the Lord. And then we saw as Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove to go to Mount Carmel where altars were built. They went first and they prayed for their God to answer and nothing happened. And then Elijah built an altar, 12 stones, and took on 12 barrels of water to saturate it, to establish that there was no way, humanly speaking, that anything could ever come or ignite that. And Elijah stood up and he prayed and he asked the Lord to show himself to his people that he was the one true God and God answered with fire. And then rain came. Then, of course, Elijah encountered personally Jezebel when she threatened to take his life. And then Elijah went on the run and God was gracious to him and God brought him back and restored him and reminded him that he had a purpose for his life. And a part of that purpose was to anoint two kings and then also to anoint a man by the name of Elisha to take his office. And so then we don't see too much about Elijah and his ministry. We see an encounter in Naboth's vineyard where he brings the judgment that God had sentenced upon Ahab and Jezebel for their mistreatment of that man when they had him uh, put to death. They accused him, falsely accused him, stole his property from him, and God saw that. Then we watched last week as Ahab's son, who was just king for two years, had an encounter as well with Elijah and those that were with him. You remember the two groups of 50 that went up and told him to come down and go, oh, come down quickly. And then finally that third leader of 50 soldiers came and on his knees asked for Elijah to help him and to spare his life. And finally somebody was getting it and figuring out God and God's authority in Israel. And now we come to 2 Kings chapter 2 and we see interaction between Elijah and Elisha on the day that the Lord would take Elijah to heaven. We do not know how they knew. There doesn't tell us that. Uh, but somehow it was known because even those who were of the schools of the prophets communicated with Elisha such that this would be Elijah's day to be taken up in a, into heaven by a whirlwind. Now I want to read a few things for you and make a couple of general statements and then we'll focus in on a message today that I think will be very applicable and helpful to each of us. First of all, I want you to notice the opening statement of chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, and it came to what? It came to pass. 398 times in the Bible that expression is used. Sometimes it's used specifically in regards to something took place and because of that happening, this came to pass. And sometimes it's just a general term. Seemingly here it's a general term, but there's great truth to that statement. And it came to pass. Your life is passing. Each year is clicking off. Each week, each moment, each opportunity. Elijah, who prayed... And God developed him and God set him up as a prophet to come and confront Ahab. And seemingly that ministry would last 24 years. Now is coming to a close. All of our lives, as we think of our ministry and our earthly opportunities, are coming to a close. Every time we have a holiday, every time a Thanksgiving clicks off, or then we'll be heading on towards Christmas and then a New Year's. It's always amazing to me. It seems like those dates, those special dates where we pause for a little bit, we reflect, we look back at pictures, or we look back and we consider that time has moved by. And time does move by. And I would encourage you and remind you today to make the most of your opportunities. The book of Ephesians tells us that we're to redeem the time. You're here today for a purpose. You're hearing this message for a purpose today. 
You're here listening to me today by God's design. And I think that there is something from God's word and something that maybe he would use me to say, to speak into your life that would help you or to direct you. And I would encourage us each to realize this. It does come to pass. There'll never be this Sunday to do over again. There'll never be this message or this opportunity. That should sober us up. It should also cause us to appreciate the moments that we have. Make sure you say to those around you that you love them. Make sure if you're at aught with them, you make things right. If you're erring today, if you find yourself traveling down a path of destruction, a path of sin, then receive the admonition and the correction of the Holy Spirit today and stop where you're at. Turn to Him, forsake it, and get going in the right direction. If you're here this morning, you say, Preacher, I'm too far gone. No one's too far gone from the mercy and the grace of God. Your life may not look like it once looked, It may be different than what it was, but it can still be what the Lord would make of it. And I'll assure you of this. The devil is wasteful and he throws things away. God is the restorer. God can take things that you and I thought could never be whole. God can take things that you and I thought could never be beautiful and make them beautiful and accomplish his great purpose and his great grace in that. Oftentimes it's the greatest messes that make the greatest pictures of God's goodness and God's grace. And as long as we have life, as long as we have this day, As long as we have this moment, well, we seize upon it and let the Lord use our lives. And it came to pass. It seems like as we look at the lives of the kings in a timeline that Elijah, from the time that he anointed Elisha to be the one that would take his place, that it's been 10 years now. And I suspect in that 10 years they've had a lot of conversations. I expect that there's been a lot of uh, development and establishment of Elisha the prophet. Seems like another thing that the Lord has done in Elijah's life. You remember that Elijah seemingly was a loner. That was even his cry. Remember when he was frustrated with Jezebel and the situation there? He said that he was the only one. I'm the only one who has a heart for God. I'm the only one. And the Lord reminded him that there were thousands who had not bent their knee. And it would seem to me that in the last portion of Elijah's ministry, he had learned to invest in others. And he's going to, part of this story here that we're reading is he's going to travel to various places where there are people who are referenced as the school of the prophets. There are people that he's working with, men that he's investing in and helping. And I want to encourage us all today with what life you have to live. Live it for others. Live it investing in others. Give of your life for the cause of Christ. You'll not regret it. Give to Him and let your life and the value of your life, whether it be the last portion or whatever time you have, well, give it all to God and let God get the glory from what you have. And seemingly Elijah now has established these and been involved in this. And on this day, it's time for this departure. And I want you to notice there are four places. And I've read this story many, many times and it never jumped out to me. But as I was reading it and studying it here in the last few days and weeks on this topic here I noticed that the Lord was real specific and not just telling you that Elijah needed to go someplace but naming the places we're going to start in a place called Gilgal we're going to go from there to a place called Bethel we're going to go from there to Jericho and then we're going to go to Jordan if I were to put a map up this morning it would seem like they make a big circle walk because Gilgal is not that far removed from Jordan from Jordan they'll walk in about seemingly seven miles into Bethel From Bethel, they'll travel back around and come back around to a place called Jericho. And then from Jericho, they'll find themselves back at the Jordan, probably passing by in some way Gilgal and heading back there. It's a circle. Now, I don't know that there's significance to that, but I did have this thought in looking at it. Doesn't it seem like sometimes the Lord brings you full circle? But sometimes the lessons that you need to learn in life, you just kind of start here and you find your way right back where you're at. Sometimes we have a problem and we don't deal with that problem and the Lord has a way of bringing us back to facing that problem again. Sometimes in life we have challenges and our life is all about facing that first challenge. But here on this day, seemingly they'll walk 30 plus miles as they journey from spot to spot. And you'll notice here and I'll for time's sake, Elijah will say to Elisha numerous times, stay here. Stay here. You stay put right here. And then you'll hear again the same declaration multiple times from Elisha to Elijah. Hey, as long as you're alive, as long as your soul is here, I'm going to stick with you. I'm with you. I wondered uh, why. Why? What's the purpose in that? Is it maybe like when the Lord Jesus at times with his disciples would throw a hard statement out to them to see who he could shake loose? Was it a test of discipleship? Was it a test of a commitment? I don't know. 
I don't know, I, I, there's several things about this that I can just simply look at and say, okay, maybe this and maybe that. But here's what I do know. What I do know is that Elisha, for whatever reason, profoundly was committed to sticking close to Elijah. No matter where he was going, even knowing that it was a difficult day, even knowing what was in store, he wanted to be near him. Elijah is the prophet of God. Elijah is the mouthpiece of God. In a sense, Elijah is a picture of the Word of God. Elisha wanted to be where the truth was at. Elisha wanted to stay with the things of God. That was his commitment. And so they make that first commitment there in a place called Gilgal. I read a moment ago for you, and we'll come back to that this evening, that when they cross over Jordan, Elijah looks to Elisha after this day of walking together and talking together, and these four times where this commitment was made that I'm staying with you, and he says, okay, we've come to the end. I'll be leaving soon. What is it that you want from me? What is it that I can do for you? You've stuck right alongside of me. I couldn't shake you loose, and you're still here. What is it? And he said, I want you to do something. I want a double portion of thy spirit. A double portion harkens back to the book of Deuteronomy. There was a promise given that the firstborn would receive a double portion. A double portion was significant because really what Elisha wanted was he wanted to become the next Elijah. He desired to hold that office. He desired to lead those men in the schools of the prophets. He desired to have a ministry like Elijah's for God and for his people in Israel. He desired that the Lord would use him the same way that God had used Elijah. Would to God that today we would have people who desired to be used of God. Would to God today that there would be people who had a burning passion in their heart like missionaries of old days who've traveled across the seas to take the gospel to people into unknown places. Would to God there would be people who had a desire to take the work of Christ overseas. Would to God today that there might even be some young men who are sitting in the chair today or in the pew somewhere today hearing the word of God preached and say, boy, you know what? I, I, I would like for God, if it would be his will, I would like for God to use me that way to preach the word of God to people. Would to God there maybe be some young men who would look back in the past and see how God had used evangelists in the years gone by to hold great campaigns in cities where many people were preached the gospel and many people responded. Would to God there'd be some young people and maybe even not so young, just some people in general of God who would say, hey, I sure want my life to be fruitful for the Lord. I want my life to count for the cause of Christ. Would to God there'd be some people who'd say, boy, I want the Lord to bless my life in such a way that I could give and support missions and give and be supportive of bus ministry. Well, would to God there'd be some people today who'd say, boy, I'd like for the Lord to use me to reach my community with the gospel of Christ. So oftentimes I'm afraid that our prayer and our interest is self-serving. Today we have those who would come to church looking for the experience rather than being used by God to experience a fruitful life, a commitment. Elisha will stand out amongst his peers. His peers on several occasions here will communicate, hey, what you doing there? Don't you know he's leaving today? What are you doing? Where are you going? What are you going to do? His peers will not travel on. His peers will stay put, so to speak. They'll not cross over in a moment. But Elisha will, and Elijah will say, what do you want I want a double portion. I want to be used of God in a, a fashion like you've been used. I want a double portion of your spirit. There's a lot of things to take from that. I want you to see some things about the various places that they stopped in. And I think it bears out. Actually, I think if you were to look in the book of Philippians, and will not for time's sakes, in chapter 3, verses 6 through 10, something that we covered not that long ago in our study of the book of Philippians, I think you see the very outline that I'm going to show you there in the life of the Apostle Paul. Maybe it's not the best title, but I would use this title for this. The man who would desire a double portion. The man who would desire a double portion. First of all, we find them in a place called Gilgal. Gilgal is very significant to the people of Israel. It was in Gilgal in Joshua chapter 4 and Joshua chapter 5 when the Lord had led Joshua in leading the people of God after their many years of wandering in the wilderness, when one generation passed away and a new generation rose up, it was there in Gilgal that God led Joshua in leading the people across the Jordan, of River, across the Jordan River to this location called Gilgal. 
It was in Gilgal where after parting and crossing the Red, or Jordan River, rather, they took 12 stones and they established a monument. And the Lord said, in this place called Gilgal, anytime somebody asks, what mean these stones, you tell them that we are the people of Israel, that God brought us out of Egypt, that God brought us out of the wilderness, that God mercifully led us out of those years of wandering, that he crossed the Jordan River, and that he brought us here, and he's established us. We serve a living God. Our God is alive, and our God is working. There was another thing that took place there in Joshua chapter 5, and I'll touch on it very carefully. In Joshua chapter 5, that entire generation had, not, had never been physically separated, the males, uh, and their relationship to God. God told Joshua to sharpen the knives uh, and to deal with the people and to help them to have that physical expression of their commitment, the males, to God through circumcision. There was a cutting away there. The Bible gives that in detail there and the description of that, that there was a need for that generation now to be separated and to express their relationship to a living God. The man who would have a double portion needs to recognize something in Gilgal. Number one, that is that we serve a living God. We serve a living God. We serve a living God. We serve a prayer answering God. We serve a soul saving God. We save a wonder-working God. We serve a God who said, let there be light, and there was light. We serve a God who made all there is, and a God whom, and through that, that God, you and I have our being and our movement today. We serve a living God. And I think at times we struggle in our commitment because we do not recognize how living our God is. He is alive and well. He is concerned. He is interested He's not off somewhere, not blinded to what's going on. He is a God who is alert to the sparrow's cry. He is a God who is alert to the cry of Ishmael and Hagar and their distress. He is a God who knows the hairs on your head and has a maintenance of the numbering of them. He is a God who is alive. It's important to understand who God is because God does call upon us to separate our lives to Him. This morning you separated your life to come to church. You separated yourself from a warm bed. You separated yourself from others who are doing other things on the Lord's day. But you gave of your time to come today. Why did you come today? What do you seek today? Why are you here today? There are many things to be involved in. There are many organizations to find membership in. Why are we here today? Because we have what? We have a living God. We serve a risen Savior, right? We serve a living God. That's why we're here. And the man who would receive a double portion must be strong in his recognition of who God is. Who was God to Israel? He was the God that had formed them. He was the God that had delivered them. He was the God who had led them. He was the God who had given them Moses and the law. He was the God who had been merciful to them even after their hard-heartedness and not entering in. He was the God who had given them Joshua. He was the God who had parted the Jordan for them. So many things could be said. He was a living God and he is a living God. Not only that, we recognize that Gilgal, a cutting place, when I come to the understanding that he is a living God, that I'm then forced and or faced with this decision. Will I live and serve a living God? Will I serve him if he is alive, if I have my being in him? I think as creator and creation, there's an obligation that we have to recognize who God is. One of the benchmarks for our society has been that we have recognized that the rights that we have are given to us by our God. Whether people were believers in Christ or not, founding fathers recognized there's one God and that one God created all that there is and there's an obligation and a responsibility we hold to that God to be separate in our living to Him. Why should I love my neighbor? Because God commands me to. Why should I obey rules? Why should I obey laws? Because God has given that order to things and God has called upon us to do that. If I evolved and if I just came from nowhere, if I'm just some kind of irritated bump that became, then why in the world would I ever be governed by anyone? And this is the dilemma that the world is in today. Because when you throw off God, you throw off order. And you enter into chaos. And if all there is came from chaos then let chaos reign. But if God made me, 
If God made all there is, then let God reign and let God be God. Amen? And so it calls for us to be separate in that. You, you, you separate in your life when you give of your resources and your finances. You give to God and you separate in your life when you make much of Him in your communication, when you're governed by Him, when you allow your passions in life to be directed by Him. So oftentimes in society we say things today, well, I just don't think or I don't feel. It doesn't matter how you think. It doesn't matter how you feel. It matters what does God say. Amen. How does God direct that I should think? How does God direct that I should feel? Because there's some crazy people feeling a lot of crazy things these days and thinking a lot of crazy things. That doesn't make it so. God is truth. God's Word is truth. When we come to that place of recognizing a living God, then we come to an understanding that there needs to be a cutting place and or a separation to serve Him. It's there in that place that Elijah will say to Elisha, you stay here, God's called me to Bethel. Again, Elisha travels on. They come to Bethel. Bethel, we're reminded of a man by the name of Jacob who in Genesis chapter 28 experienced the presence of God and declared that that place's name would be changed to Bethel, meaning house of God, because he met God there. Years later, he would return and call it El Bethel, the God of the house of God. But the significance of Bethel is that it was the presence of the Lord that was felt and experienced there. The man who would have a double portion must first recognize and understand that there is a living God, that we're to be separate in our life, our life service and dedicated to His truth. The man who would have a double portion must also understand the value and the importance of the presence of the Lord. And I speak to you of the presence of the Lord in a very real and genuine sense. The presence of the Lord that is known not through works of righteousness, but is known through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. For the New Testament believer, it's the salvation that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that Spirit bearing witness with our spirit, His presence. Not just in that, but also His presence in our daily life. When I was a child, I was taught right and wrong. I was governed in such a way that directed in my life that right would be accomplished and that wrong would be avoided. I knew where to go. I knew what to say. I knew what to do. I knew what not to do. But there was something that I needed. First, I needed the Lord in salvation. And friend, then I needed the Lord in His presence in my life. A personal walk with Him. Knowing Him. The Apostle Paul said that I may know Him. Knowing Him. When I had made commitments in my life to follow the living God and separated myself to that service, I knew Him as my Lord. I knew Him as my Savior. But I needed to grow in my knowledge of who he is in my own personal life. There's a lot of folks that are in church. And you're, you're in Christ, but you're not growing in the knowledge of Christ in you. You're saved. You know who you believed on, but that process of him persuading you that he is able to keep that which you've, he's committed unto you, you're not growing there. Young people, it's a danger of growing up in church. It's the danger of hearing these things in and out week after week, hearing about the Lord and hearing about the Word of God and being around them. And not that we don't believe them, but we're not growing and developing personally in our knowledge and our understanding of the presence of the Lord in our life. If you read the Bible because you have to, not because the Lord is feeding you, if you're spending time in prayer because you've been, you've been commanded to, and I'm thankful for that command, and it's a good thing because the Lord leads us to do things that are right by commandment. But there's a develop in the life of a child of God that brings us to the Word of God because He's feeding me. There's a development in that walk with the Lord when it comes to our prayer life where it's no longer out of commandment, but it's out of desire in relationship. And for me, as a young adult, that was something that I needed to do. I, I knew what I was supposed to do. I knew who I was supposed to be. But I was not connected. I was not abiding in the Lord as I needed to. And it's a journey, isn't it? We move forward in that. And how it ought to be developed in each of our hearts today. Knowing Him and getting to know Him in a better way. Moving past just the rules of things. And I'm thankful for good structure but moving into relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, first in salvation, but then also, friend, in surrender and knowing Him. When I was a boy, I would hear songs like, Every Day with Jesus is what? Sweeter than the day before. 
I didn't understand that. But I can tell you now, as I grow older and grow in grace, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. He satisfies our needs. I would hear that hymn, I'd rather have Jesus than what? Than anything. And I would think to myself, well, I, that sounds good, but there's a lot of things I'd like to have. But you know, the Lord wants to bring us to that place, doesn't he? Where the presence of the Lord and being in his presence, spending time with him is something that we crave and something that we need to go forward. The man who would have a double portion, a separation to a living God, a separation from the past of Egypt and a separation to service now to this God who is alive. An understanding of the importance and the priority of the Lord's presence in our life. It was there in Bethel they encountered that first 50 students. And it's there in Bethel that Elijah says to Elisha, you stay here. And he says, no, I won't. I said, I've got to go to Jericho. In Jericho, there's another group that's been established there to be, to be students or to be schooled in the uh, matter of the office of prophet. It's there in Jericho that we see now Elijah and Elisha travel. Jericho is significant to us. In Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, the Lord appeared to Joshua and gave him commandment and gave him hope regarding his presence and the victory that would come. In Joshua chapter 6, we see that the walls of Jericho were straightly shut up. This massive city, the first one that Israel would encounter in the promised land, surrounded by those walls, and it was there that Israel was commanded to march around one time per day leading up to that final day where they would walk multiple times and then they would blow trumpets. They were told to be quiet the whole time until it was time for the victory to come. And it was there in Jericho that the people of Israel learned to do what? To walk by faith and not by sight. Elisha, the man who would take the office of Elijah, Elisha, the man who would request a double portion, was traveling that day on a journey, and I believe a learning for you and I to see. Separation to a living God. Priority in the Lord's presence. And then a walk of, for the Lord is done by faith and not by sight. There are times when we come up against things that we have no earthly understanding of how God can bring victory. There are times when we face situations where we, we just don't see how it's possible that it could ever be corrected or be helped. But we trust God anyhow. And we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk on. We trust Him. We battle at times against things that are going on in the world and we ask ourselves, are we getting anywhere? Is there anything coming from this? We look at our lives, if we're not careful, and our sight kind of like it was with Peter when the storms came up as he was walking on water. Our eyes take, are taken from the Lord and they're put to the storms of life. And we begin to question even, am I going in the right direction? Am I accomplishing the right task, the right purposes in life? Does it really matter? What's the sense in all of it? And then we're brought back to the knowledge of the Scripture. We're brought back to that commitment that we have to the Lord to walk by faith and not by sight. We're to be kind to those who are not kind to us. We're to be loving to those who who do not express love back towards us. We're to be tenderhearted. We're to be forgiving. And sometimes that goes against the grain of what I see, but that's the walk by faith and not by sight. We're to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for his children. We're to obey our parents in the Lord, for this is right. We're to be directed in that church. We're to go forward with the gospel, sometimes wondering, is the seed that's being sown, is there any development, is there any growth? Are we making a difference? But we go forward and we go on by faith and not by sight. Young people, you make decisions in your life now that will impact and affect those that are around you and will have an eternal impact on others. Make sure you make those decisions by faith and not by sight. This world today is alluring. The world today is confusing. The world today has painted pictures of things that are not so. They make sin appear fun, and it is fun for a season, but it's short-lived. But when we live and walk by faith, by obedience to God's Word, by submission to God's Word, even in difficult times, even in times when we question even what's going on in our lives, when we get to the other side of it, we're so thankful so thankful that we've held on to the hand of the Good Shepherd and He's brought us through. The man who would have a double portion, a separation to a living God, a priority in the Lord's presence and a walk by faith and not by sight. I bring you to the fourth and final jumping off point here in the life 
of Elijah and Elisha. Again, Elijah will say to Elisha, why don't you stay here in Jericho? I've got to go to Jordan. Elisha says, no, I'm going with you. Wherever you go, as long as you're alive, I'm sticking with you. And so they come to Jordan. It's there at Jordan that 50 of uh, uh, the students of the school of the prophets will stay on one side, Jordan. And Elijah says, I'm going over. And Elisha says, I'm going with you. It's there when we see that Elisha will part the Jordan and these two men will walk on and they'll continue to communicate. Jordan is an expression of deliverance from the old to the new. It was the Jordan River that had to be parted by God for the children of Israel. We referenced Gilgal a moment ago where they ended up after they parted, after it was parted and they crossed over. We watch now as they come to the banks of the Jordan, this new generation of Israel. The old generation has wandered and passed off and here we have these people who these things now are becoming their life and their decisions. They've watched as a generation has wandered and been buried and now they come to the Jordan and Joshua says to them, hey, you take that ark, that expression of the leadership of the Lord, and when that water, they step down in that water and they begin to make their way through, God's going to part it. It took faith for them to step in. And when those men stepped in with that Ark of the Covenant, just as God said He would, the Jordan River was parted and the people walked over. And when they crossed over and they got to the other side, God said through this crossing of the Jordan and this parting that He accomplished that He was removing the reproach of Egypt from them, that they were now a new generation and God was doing something in their lives. I believe this speaks to something in our life, and that is in a total commitment. A total commitment to the new things that the Lord wants to do in our lives. I'm not talking new in the sense of a new day, but I'm talking as new, new creations in Christ. This is dying to self. This is leaving the old life on the other side of Jordan, and it's crossing over and saying, Lord, I want everything that you have for me. You see, Elisha desired a double portion. When God led the children of Israel into the promised land, that was a type and a picture of victorious or successful Christian living. It was a type of having in our lives and experiencing in our lives everything that the Lord wants for us. That's answers to prayer. That's hope in the midst of storms. That's peace in the midst of trial. That's love for our enemy. That's, that's a comfort in the midst of difficulties in life. It's living a life for eternal purposes and experiencing the fruitfulness of that. It's resting in Christ. And that requires of us a Jordan moment. And I'll remind you that 50 of them stayed on one side. Only Elisha went through. The Lord Jesus spoke of this to extent. In Joshua chapter 12, go ahead and turn there. I'm sorry, John chapter 12. Too much turkey. John chapter 12, verses 23 through 26. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. How would Jesus be glorified? What a bloody glorification Christ would endure. The cross. But through that glorification, through that surrender and that submission to God's will for his life, through self-denial, Jesus, who obeyed God, even was obedient even to the death of the cross, through his death, that seed that's planted and goes through the process there of what happens in the ground, it leads to what? It leads to bearing fruit. The life that is given to God, the life of self-denial, that life, as the Lord would put it, of taking up our cross, that life of living for him and selling out to his new purposes for our life, crossing over Jordan, leaving the old behind, and saying, I want everything that the Lord has for me. That requires of self, leaving that back. No longer me, but thee. No longer what I want, but I want what you want. And I suppose one could say, preacher, that's a life, and that's a process, and I would agree with that. Romans chapter 12 tells us to present our bodies, what? A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our what? reasonable service the man who would have a double portion and would take over the leadership in israel is a man who first was taught to separate and follow a living god to put god in the order of god's in his life and priority to have a strong priority on the presence of the lord in his life to walk by faith and not by sight and then to cross the jordan to leave the old behind 
and embrace the new. May I ask you a question? Have you left the old behind to embrace the new? Are you growing in the Lord? Are you developing in the Lord? The Bible tells us that we're not no longer to walk in the flesh, but rather we're to walk in the Spirit. There's a war that battles between that old and the new, that working of the flesh and those appetites, those attitudes and those learned behaviors, and now there is the Spirit saying, listen, follow me. Follow me to higher ground. Is your marriage still mired in the old? Isn't it time to embrace the new? Isn't it time, sir, to love your wife and to be committed to your wife as the Lord has called you to? Ladies, likewise, to your husbands, to our homes, to the purpose of our life, to those things that we love, to those things that we hold dear. Isn't it time to say, hey, all to Jesus I surrender. When Elisha stepped over with Elijah across the Jordan, it was just the two of them. And the Bible says they went on and talked. And then Elijah said, what is it that you want from me? I want a double portion. Well, I don't know that you could ever say that Elisha deserved a double portion. If we got what we deserved, what would we have? I don't think you could say that Elisha earned it. But I definitely would say this. Elisha understood. He understood what was necessary in his life to have a double portion. And he was growing as you and I are. What did he see? First, separation to a living God. Two, a priority on the Lord's presence. Three, a walk by faith and not by sight. And four, leaving the old behind and embracing the new and desiring what the Lord had for him fully, that double portion. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you now considering the life of Elijah and Elisha in this ministry. And Lord, there's, I think, great value to this testimony that we see here in the life of both Elijah and Elisha. I think, Lord, there's learning points here. And Holy Spirit, I would trust that you would take your word today and that as it's put out, it would not return void. Maybe along the way you see some places in your life or some decisions, development in your life. Who would say this morning, preacher, there was something in that the Lord would speak to me through his word about my life and my growth in the Lord Jesus. You'd say, preacher, please pray for me. Would you raise your hand, anyone like that this morning? Father, you see our hands. More than that, you know our hearts. A need to recognize you as the living God, to allow you to order our life. Uh, a priority on your presence, spending time with you, knowing you in a greater and deeper way. Uh, Jericho. Walking by faith and not by sight. Trusting you, Lord, in all things. And, Lord, also even that Jordan and embracing of the new. Now don't, let, don't, don't let your life be hindered. Let the Lord bring you along. Let the Lord develop you. Now don't listen to the argument of the enemy. Now don't, don't, don't take that stuff any longer. Don't take the lies and the strongholds of Satan. But, friend, be yielded to Christ. You'll be amazed at what the Lord will do with your life if you'd yield to Him. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved, that I'm on my way to heaven. I don't know, as uh, we spoke even about life there in the opening statement of that chapter, I don't know for sure that if today were to be my last day, so to speak, that I would be in the presence of the Lord. I don't have that hope of salvation. You'd say, Preacher, please pray for me. I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Please pray for me, Preacher. Would you pray for me? Would you lift your hand and say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'd like to know that, but I'm not sure of that. I trust this morning as the Lord would move in your life in whatever way that he does, you'd respond to him. If you can make it to the altar, I would strongly recommend it. If the Lord's doing business with you, you step out in faith and believing him and his word, having confidence in that. This morning you do not know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Would you let somebody today, there are men, there are ladies who would be glad to take the gospel and show you today the greatest news you could ever see, and that's how you could be born again.